So I'm up here again. Hopefully you're not tired of me yet. But uh, So I thought we'd have a little bit of fun with this session. And uh, I'm doing my talk on the five lies people love to tell about the software-defined data center. Some of these I've heard in the room today. Um, so I'm going to do a little, little debunking in my pitch. So first off, my vendor pitch will teach you about the software-defined data center. Now, the, the vendors have actually been pretty well behaved today, so we haven't had a lot of this, but I don't think anybody in the room actually believes this, and that's not what you came here uh, to, to hear today, uh, was vendor pitches. So I've done you a favor, I've condensed my entire vendor pitch down to two slides at the beginning, and then we'll move on. So here it is. So for those that aren't familiar with SolidFire, SolidFire is a scale-out, high-performance storage system designed specifically for large-scale infrastructure uh, with a lot of presence in public and private clouds. Uh, it's the largest and fastest all-SSD storage system on the market today. It uses a, a node-based scale-out architecture that can scale from five nodes to over 100 nodes, over three and a half petabytes of capacity industry standard hardware, 10 gigabit ethernet, all the magic is done in software. Um, and it has a very rich software feature set, particularly when you talk about some of the things that are important in the software defined data center, which I'll be touching on. So multi-tenancy, quality of service, REST APIs, uh, deep integration into platforms like OpenStack, CloudStack, and VMware, uh, as well as a comprehensive set of enterprise data services. Now, I, I asked my marketing department to make this a little bit more software Define specific. So there you go. SolidFire software defined storage solution. Oh, look, they edited that slide too. Um, so our customers, again, are some of the most demanding enterprise and, and uh, cloud service provider environments today. We sit at the core of a number of the largest public cloud offerings on the market today, uh, typically infrastructure as a service environments, places where scale, performance, automation, efficiency are all extremely important, uh, and an increasing number of enterprises that are trying to adopt those same cloud-like capabilities or in this case, software-defined capabilities in their own data center. So this is an area that we know very well. Uh, my background, for those that aren't familiar with, uh, with myself, I, I actually came from Rackspace. Uh, I was there for about a year and a half helping them build and launch their first cloud computing efforts. So the software-defined data center, the public and private cloud, uh, is an area that I know very well. All right, enough of the pitch. Let's get on to the lies. First lie, you can't define the software-defined data center. It's just a buzzword like cloud. Now, Jesse actually did a pretty good job of, of defining it. Um, he took the Wikipedia definition for it. Um, I, I took my own crack at this because I think it is important as we talk about the software defined data center to actually define what it is we're talking about. So here we go. The software defined data center, it's a pooled resource model for the data center uh, that eliminates silos of compute, storage, and networking created around individual applications. Um, it's got software-based provisioning, control, and reporting that's vendor agnostic to the underlying compute, storage, and networking resources. Uh, we decouple application provisioning from the physical hardware that it's using. And at the end of the day, hopefully turn the data center into a resource that can be programmed like software. Uh, so this is, uh, I believe, the model of the software-defined data center that we're working towards. We're certainly not there yet, uh, but is ultimately where I think we're going to arrive. So with that as a definition, what's really important in the software-defined data center? What actually matters as you're looking at solutions that claim to be part of the software-defined data center infrastructure? Um, so the first is vendor neutrality. I think this is actually very important. We've talked today about standards. Uh, we've talked about de facto standards, open source standards, industry standards. There's all kinds of standards out there. Whatever you want, there's a standard for it. Um, but the bottom line is that if you are going to build a large uh, software-defined data center, the ability to swap in different components over time and actually have multiple vendors and multiple solutions in there, whether or not you actually utilize that capability on day one, is extremely important. Second is very simple management and comprehensive APIs for all of your infrastructure elements. I touched on this on the uh, architecture panel earlier today when I talked about the fact that you can't automate things that aren't simple to begin with. If it is extremely complex to manage, it will be impossible to automate. Third is software and systems that are designed for multi-tenancy. Uh, this is something we touched on in the architecture panel earlier today as well, which is that the software-defined data center, by its nature, is going to be multi-tenant. We'll talk about in a second what happens if it really is just a single-tenant data center. And lastly, underlying infrastructure that can deliver consistent resources, guaranteed quality of service, SLAs. If you don't have fundamental building blocks in your infrastructure that can deliver a consistent set of resources, you're never going to be able to automate and control that. You're going to need a human to go in there and figure out why something isn't working, to turn the dials, to turn the knobs, and get it working again. So these are some of the things that are really important in the software-defined data center. 
On to line number two. Everyone needs the software defined data center. I think uh, anyone selling SDDC would agree with that. The reality is that uh, most companies don't even need their own data center anymore. And if, even if you have your own data center, the tenants and the capabilities of the software defined data center really only matter at scale. So scale where, you, where the efficiency of a pooled infrastructure actually matters to your bottom line. Scale where the upfront complexity of setting up a software defined data center can actually pay off in the long term and operational savings. Uh, and, set up, uh, and scale where there's a rate of infrastructure change that's a barrier to progress. If you only have to deploy one virtual machine a month, you probably don't need a software defined data center. And the reality is, if you aren't at this type of scale these days, you probably shouldn't be running your own infrastructure anyway. Now, people will debate this, um, but the bottom line is there are probably other places that you can host your infrastructure, whether it's in a public cloud, whether it's in a managed hosting provider, whether it's in a colo, um, but you can probably hand off a lot of that responsibility to someone who does it better, and in fact, they probably have a software-defined data center themselves. And just to be specific, so what's not at scale? What do I mean by folks that are, that are really not at scale today? Uh, well, I would say today anyone that's got less than 300 virtual machines has no business running their own infrastructure, unless they just like to do it for fun. Um, but I would say that bar is moving up very quickly. I would say in the near future, with the capabilities uh, that are out there in the public cloud, as well as the price drops that we're seeing, anyone less than 3,000 virtual machines probably has no business running their own infrastructure. And at that scale, and once you get beyond that scale, the tenants of the software-defined data center become very important. So the third lie, software-defined data center, it's just virtualization. We already do that. We talked about this earlier today. A lot of people think that the cloud or their private cloud is just my ESX cluster, and I already have that. So what do I need the software-defined data center for? Um, and the reality is virtualization was really the start of the software-defined data center. Ten years ago, with ESX coming into production applications in the enterprise data center, that really is, is what kicked off this first, uh, the first wave of the software-defined data center, and it really showed the power of it. It showed the power of a pu uh, pooled model for compute, one where you didn't need to dedicate physical hardware and servers to each application, where you could have a relatively rapid deployment of new virtual machines, and where you could actually have VM sizing that wasn't tied to physical hardware. The level of agility, speed, flexibility that came with virtualizing compute was a huge step forward. But it was really just the beginning. And it didn't fundamentally change the management paradigm for the data center. Infrastructure was still, by and large, under administrator control. Now, they were having to go through a GUI to provision something instead of racking and stacking bricks in the data center, but fundamentally, it didn't change how things were being managed, and it was still very much a manual provisioning model that was being used. And at the end of the day, it really only covered compute. So storage systems and networking were still managed separately. They had their own teams, they had their own tool sets, they got to fight with the virtualization guys on who controlled what, but at the end of the day, it was not a single model for administering the data center. And so that's really why virtualization is an important part of the software-defined data center model, but it's really just the beginning, and that there are several more steps that are needed to fully recognize the value of a software-defined data center. So lie number four. So Jesse touched on this earlier. Uh, you can't be software-defined if you include hardware. And there are certainly people out there in the market that are selling particularly storage systems that you can buy uh, as software that uh, would like you to believe that if you have hardware in your solution, you are not software defined or you cannot be part of a software defined data center. Um, and I think it's important because there are different trends that are kind of converging here. Uh, but it's important to understand that when we talk about the software defined data center, we're talking about the management, not the sales model. And that's, those are two very different things. As Jesse pointed out, you can't have a software-defined data center without hardware. Sorry, it's just not going to work. You actually have to run uh, your workloads on something. So you've got to have the hardware. Um, and particularly as it applies to storage, virtually all modern storage systems are software-based. They're using x86 chips in them. The majority of the storage functionality is written in software, not on ASICs. Uh, and whether they're sold as software or bundled with hardware, most of them are software-based. But that doesn't mean that they are software-defined, which is very different. The other thing to really point out about being software-defined as it applies to storage is that the storage system, as we talk about the software-defined data center, should be part of the data plane in the data center, not the control plane. 
And this is something that's often missed by storage vendors who want to make the storage system the center of the universe, right? The reality is the storage system should be the resource being managed in the software defined data center by the automation and orchestration layers. It's not the resource manager. It's not the center of the world. You should not be managing your virtual machines through your storage environment. Um, that's not the right way to think about it. The reality is that you need a, so a storage system that provides a set of capabilities that higher level orchestration and management frameworks, that higher level software defined management systems can tap into and utilize. It is just the tool, not the tool set. Um, now one of the things that often comes up is where do you draw the line for advanced functionality? Snapshots, replication, deduplication, backup. Is that part of the data plane? Is that part of the control plane? Should it be embedded in the storage system? Should it be a separate set of processes to manage that? How dumb should the storage really get? Um, and it's, it's an open question, right? We've seen, in fact, all of those, I think, except deduplication, implemented in VMware today. You can have extremely dumb storage and get some of this functionality with VMware, but I think we've also seen that at the end of the day, it doesn't work that well. And most people want to leverage much more tightly coupled data services with their data. Um, and why? Because quite frankly, these things work a lot better when they're more tightly aligned with the overall architecture of the storage system. And there are a wide variety of architectures available in storage systems today. And how you do snapshots on one versus another, how you do replication, and particularly very space efficient replication, is going to vary very heavily. And putting a generic software layer on top that doesn't understand the underlying storage architecture uh, is probably not gonna be successful there. So for me, um, I think you draw the line at including the uh, storage functionality in the storage system. That is part of the data plane, part of the storage layer. But the key is to expose these capabilities with a rich set of APIs that allows the control plane to tap into them, that allows VMware to tell your storage system when to snapshot a virtual machine, that tells, allows it to tell it when to replicate it to another storage system or another location, that allows uh, a project like OpenStack to dictate quality of service so that the application owner can say, I need 10,000 IOPS for this database, or I need a latency of X for my database. And the control plane can talk to the storage system and have the storage system enforce that. And the storage system is a much better place to enforce that than at a control plane where it's making a lot of guesses and doesn't really understand the underlying storage architecture. So line number five, converged infrastructure is required for the software defined data center. And I don't think I've actually heard this stated today, but I have uh, heard these two things equated in people's minds, and including in storage analysts, that converged infrastructure and software-defined data center is the same thing, and that we are definitely moving into a world where compute and storage and networking will all be run in the same box, and that is the software-defined data center. Um, and I, I don't think that's the reality. The reality is that uh, converged infrastructure can simplify, in some cases, building a software-defined data center. Um, by packaging a lot of these elements together and wrapping some nice software around them, you can definitely simplify getting to some of the uh, value of a software-defined data center. But it's not necessary. There are certainly other ways to do it that don't involve packaging all those in the same box, nor is it sufficient. Just because you have compute networking and storage in a box does not mean you have a software-defined data center. So the reality is that you can have these solutions uh, as part of it, but I would say there are also some trade-offs as well. And there are trade-offs that really run counter to some of the other ideals of the software-defined data center. For example, if you have a converged infrastructure platform with all of those elements are coming from a single vendor, have you now locked yourself into those elements? And have you lost the agility and flexibility to incorporate best of breed components, to incorporate other vendor solutions, to incorporate different storage solutions for different needs into that environment? Uh, and ultimately have lost a lot of the agility on the infrastructure side that people are looking for in the software-defined data center. So I would say that there are many advantages of you know, these, uh, these pre-built kind of converged infrastructure solutions, particularly at smaller scales, where you don't necessarily have the time or expertise to integrate best-of-breed solutions. Um, but I think a lot of those disappear at the larger scale. And as we talked about, I think larger scale is really where the benefit of the software-defined data center shows up. Uh, so these two things, while they are not uh, uh, the same thing, um, I think at the same time, there's, uh, there's a number of trade-offs that run counter to it. So with that, 
actually ran through that really quickly. Um, I'll take any questions. Absolutely, yeah. So Howard asked, uh, shouldn't that mean that the granularity of management is reduced from the LUN to the VM? Uh, and you could argue that there are many different places that it could be drawn. Uh, the VM level would be a, a very straightforward one. The application level, which may incorporate multiple virtual disks, would be another one. Um, yeah, that would kind of be like groups. Absolutely. Exactly. So, so then that's, that's actually a great point, is that one of the problems that has come from VMware sucking up a lot of the storage management into uh, its abstraction layer is losing the ability to use some of the advanced data center data services, the storage array at the VM level or at the VMDK level or at the application level. And they are just now getting around to fixing that with, uh, with VVols. And that's something that we are working and working with and implementing as it becomes available to enable some of that. And actually, uh, as I've mentioned, we've invested very heavily in OpenStack and, and working on breaking out the Cinder project that was part of Nova in OpenStack. And one of the big uh, things that we did as part of that was make sure that all of the Cinder services could apply at the individual virtual disk level. And so things like quality of service, things like replication, things like snapshots and backup could be applied at the VM level or at the VM disk level and not just at some larger aggregate file system or LUN level, so very important.